While the actual recording technology behind music is beyond essential, you can easily argue that without the varying ways that so many individuals have utilized and modified this technology over the years, there'd simply be no diversity within music. With this in mind, you can easily see the infamous wall of sound recording style as one of, if not the most revolutionary studio approach in the entire history of recorded music. Though the term wall of sound has taken on a handful of different interpretations and meanings over the decades, it began as a term for the rather radical recording technique pioneered by Phil Spector in the early 1960s. Working with a group of studio musicians now known as the Wrecking Crew, in short, Spector created a massive soundscape that had multiple layers and more reverb than one would expect, allowing it to be played and sound differently. To understand how this approach came to be, you have to remember that at that point, AM radio was far more prominent and pretty much that and jukeboxes were the only way that people would hear music. Due to this, the sound was usually rather thin and incomplete when compared to the original recording sound, and it's much the reason that to this day those early rock and roll records are so easy to pick out just based on their sound. So Spectre and his team came up with the idea that if they had multiple musicians on the same instrument performing the same sound in unison, this would be a step in providing a more accurate and better sound for people listening on the radio. Adding to this, Spectre would bring even more musicians than one could conceive, reworking the orchestrations for these larger groups, which were often as large as actual orchestras. Then, the final step in creating these wall of sound sessions, Spectre would have them play the song, which was then piped down into an echo chamber, which is basically just a hollow enclosure that allows for the sound to bounce off at all sorts of different angles, ultimately reverberating and creating even more initial sound. Basically, you had the musicians in the studio playing their part, and it went through a microphone down into the echo chamber, which was filled with a ton of other speakers and amplifiers and a single microphone. That single microphone would then take the reverberated sound, bring it up to the mixing board, and resulted in the final sound that was captured on tape. The resulting sound was one that had never been heard in the worlds of rock or pop music before, as it gave off a very full and complete sound. At the same time, Spectre's technique made the song sound far more complex and gave them more depth, and this seemingly extra sound was able to carry well over radio airwaves as well as on jukeboxes. Along with the technique, this new style allowed for Spectre to bring in a number of different instruments not previously associated with the world of rock and pop music, and many historians point to this moment as a key factor in the resurgence of classical music, as well as the artists that continue to experiment in blending classical instruments within these other worlds. Songs like Be My Baby, Da Do Ron Ron, and even the Beatles' Let It Be were all recorded using Wall of Sound technology. Though most point to Ike and Tina Turner's rendition of River Deep, Mountain High as the greatest use of the Wall of Sound approach ever. Over the decades, countless performers from all across the musical spectrum use this technology, and you can still find bands using this approach in modern times. Yet the reality remains that had it not been for Phil Spector's relentless efforts to work around the limitations of radio airplay at the time, the Wall of Sound would likely have never come to pass, and current music would sound nothing like it does. Hey!